everyone. This is uh, Diane Davies with you on Second Tuesday, uh, Kitty Lit Markets uh, Second Tuesday. Um, we are so excited today. We have as our guest uh, Dr. Artika Tyner. Um, and I was going through her uh, website this morning and right in great big letters when you first get there, it says planting seeds of social change. Wow, that says a lot. Um, I'm just so pleased to, to introduce you to her today. And uh, let me just tell you a couple of things about her. Um, she is um, a passionate educator, uh, an author, a sought after speaker. We are so fortunate to have her here for a whole half hour today. Um, and she's an advocate for justice as well. So um, she works at the University of St. Thomas, right? In the law school, is that correct? Okay, great. And um, she serves as the founding director of the Center on Race, Leadership and Social Justice. And one of the things that really uh, caught my attention was the fact that she has her doctorate in leadership. Um, you're with us today uh, to talk about uh, diversity in children's books. And um, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Um, and I just want to, uh, to say once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, here is Dr. Artika Tyner on diversity in children's books. Thank you. I appreciate the warm welcome. So I'm excited to share with you today about an opportunity for all of us. When we think about books and how books can make a difference, there's a certain magic that we can find. We, through books, I traveled throughout the world. I grew up in my community in Rondo, but through books, I traveled the globe. So books is that experience of exploration, that experience of growth, those mirrors and windows that our children need. So of course, those mirrors, that representation to see a reflection of yourself in the books that you're reading, but also those windows to open the gateway for all children, to see each other much clearly, to appreciate their cultural experiences, and to be able to embrace those differences in meaningful ways. So my presentation today will talk a little bit about what inspired me to focus specifically on looking at how do we write books through own voices? How do we write books that reflect the beauty and the rich tapestry of our world? So diversity in books for me, more than just writing our first book, Justice Makes a Difference, the story of this freedom fighter Esquire, it actually became something much more. When we were publishing our books, others said, well, how do we join you? How can we participate? How can we help plant these seeds of social change? So it ended up manifesting itself in a nonprofit organization called Planting People Growing Justice Leadership Institute, where we are committed to planting seeds of social change through that education, training, and community outreach and education. So what does it look like? It looks like a reality of growth, of possibilities, of change. So when we look at the mission, it's about everyday people having that experience of planting people growing justice, and the greatest image of it is, is our very own logo. It's the logo that represents the banyan tree. Now, for many, you may not be familiar with the banyan tree, but what makes it unique, what makes it unique out of all other trees is that the banyan tree, it grows new roots from its branches. So what does that really mean as it relates to you and I and our intergenerational approach of leadership development, community engagement, and reading and literacy and social justice advocacy, how does this all tie together? The Banyan tree gives us the inspiration. It reminds us that together we're stronger than we are apart, but more importantly, that as we continue to inspire our children our own literacy, learning, reading, and cultivating their imagination, that we are growing those new roots from the branches, that we will all be interconnected in taking those steps and moving forward and building a more just and inclusive world. So how do we do this? What does it look like? So the challenges related to literacy are real. I'll just make it personal for a moment. I started thinking about literacy in some meaningful ways because of my experience working with my clients. So of course, many people know me as Dr. Tyner. They've read my dissertation and they know that I'm committed to exploring leadership studies and how we can build and sustain social change. But before I was Dr. Tyner, I was Artiga Tyner Esquire. 
And so for far too many of my clients, they learned how to read when they were in prison. Now, if I can't think of what I would characterize as a miscarriage of justice, it's exactly that. Because it means then that how did my clients read their indictments, understand the evidence against them, or how could they even advocate for fairness in their case? So I made a personal commitment. As we think about ending mass incarceration, sometimes in life the problems seem too big to solve. But really when we're talking about ending mass incarceration, we know that the United States has 4% or excuse me, 5% of the world's population and nearly 20% of the world's prison population. So when you look at that, that leaves us in a bit of a conundrum of thinking about how do we solve this problem? It seems too big to solve. 5% of the world's population and nearly 20% of the world's prison population. How is that even possible? So oftentimes you might feel powerless, but the reality of it is, and the real leadership challenges, when the problems seem too big to solve, that's where we step in and come together as a community to help create meaningful solutions. So how does this all tie together to literacy in practical terms, you may be wondering? Well, the reality of it is one in four children are not reading at grade level by fourth grade. If you're not reading at grade level by fourth grade, you're four times more likely to drop out of school. If you drop out of school, you're three and a half times more likely to be arrested in your lifetime. Now, let's look at it in the practical terms. Let's think again about many of my clients. 85% of the children in the juvenile justice system are illiterate. If you look at it at the adult side, 60 to 80%, as you know, that pipeline feeds directly into this tangled web of mass incarceration. 60 to 80% experience illiteracy. So here's our challenge. How do we create those new pipelines to success? What do they look like? And literacy is clearly at the center of this discussion because we know that if we could improve literacy, then we could improve outcomes. And then, and then we could end one of those entry points into that tangled web of mass incarceration. And you may be thinking, Dr. Snyder, I've never heard it called a tangled web of mass incarceration. Why do you call it that? Because in my experience, the criminal justice system has far too many entry points and far fewer exit points. But here's our chance for those who are committed as not just writers or authors or illustrators, but really those who are committed as community members. Here's our chance to make a difference. So I created our first book, Justice Makes a Difference, in response to these issues. But then all of a sudden, I became a we, a team. A team came together and we founded our nonprofit, Planting People, Growing Justice. You may be thinking, then how does that tie into increasing diversity in books? Because the added challenge to this was to make sure if we were going to promote literacy, that children could see a reflection of themselves in the books that they were reading. And why is that important? to encourage reading. And how does that tie into some of the challenges that we see today? Clearly, we need more diverse books. When you're more likely to see a black bear or a black dog on the cover of a book than a black girl or a black boy. We know the statistics. And just like my work as an attorney, here I am talking to the writing community. We see the statistics and over time, I don't know if we become numb or indifferent, or just the problems, once again, feel insurmountable. So we think that there's not a way forward, a mechanism for change, but there is. It's you and I. We can make a commitment around diverse books. We can help to create them. We can help to support diverse authors. And we can turn this situation around because we want to make sure that all children are able to learn, are able to see, and able to embrace the experience of learning about other cultures and their own cultural experiences highlighted in a positive way in books. So I'll tell you about our journey a bit because it's one thing to know the statistics. It's another thing to say you support own voices or we need diverse books, but it's a radically different thing to take action. So it's not just about our books. We've been able to, through our books, so notice the transition that I made, through our books, help to promote the humanities, and the arts. And what does that look like? Our books really focus on telling the story, telling the rich story in particular for me, a mama Africa, of amazing Africa. How do we bring it together in storytelling 
history making, cultural preservation, and then with the eye to the future in this concept that now we call Afrofuturism, to be able to create, to be able to build, to be able to imagine the future right now. So when we think about this, I'll just share this proverb. And so the lion tells his side of the story. The tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. We could stop the presentation right there. That would be enough information to compel us to move forward related to diversity of books, related to cultural preservation, but more importantly, for us to understand our shared humanity and our common destiny. What you see here in the photo, and I'm smiling bright because these are my dear brothers and sisters. We traveled back home together in 2019. We answered the call from President Otto when he gave that welcome and said, return back home during the year of return. And together we came back home with the commitment, not just for ourselves, but the commitment for our community to make a difference, be impactful and make diversity, equity, inclusion. And I'm gonna add one more word that we need to make justice come alive. So here it is, I am. We learn more about the first prime minister of Ghana, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And he reminded us this piece that I'm not African because I was born in Africa, but because Africa was born in me, giving us a sense of purpose, giving us a sense of destiny, and giving us a sense of belonging. Once again, a part of the challenge, once you dig deeper into this data around illiteracy and the connection of the literacy gap and some of the challenges that we experience, you see rather quickly when you even go and ask the students directly, why do you not enjoy the books in your classroom? They will tell you, I don't see myself. Would you like to read more books that are diverse? Students may not know what that means, but then you say more books that look like you. Yes. So as we think about this, how much do you know about your history? Asking those questions, have you ever heard of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah? No. So here it is that our books can help to be a part of the solution to bringing us together as a global community. You also have the sense of I was. Many young people that you meet, they're looking for purpose, for identity. So going back and understanding our history, so here we are with our king, King Akola III, um, here we are in the Aquamu Kingdom. And I was courageous because it tells a story of the transatlantic slave trade that we don't tell. But we tell the stories of the pain, the misery, those are all there. But we don't tell the story of the triumph and courage of the Aquamu people, that instead of saying that slavery was our fate, wherever they were as enslaved Africans, they resisted slavery and fought for freedom. So the greatest example is in the King's Palace and his museum. He still has the keys from the Aquamus taking the keys back to one of the slave castles. And so you see the picture there behind our community elders as a reminder that we are courageous as a people, that our history matters, and that we were able to stand in unity to continue to fight for justice and freedom. I will be. This is Dr. W.E.B. Dubois. He reminds us that for all of us, no matter where we come from, I will be is a commitment to be a part of progress, that we must believe in life. Always human beings will live in progress to greater, broader, and fuller life. So through my books, I also inspire young people to become leaders, to those type of leaders who manifest their own change in their community. I know oftentimes we talk about it and we say, well, the mission is to be the change you wish to see in the world. And to do that, we must create, we must innovate, but we also must give our young people the tools to imagine. Imagine this type of future that Dr. Du Bois is talking about. Imagine a world full of abundance, the possibilities. Can we solve some of the most pressing issues of our time, whether it's environmental justice, whether it's related to many of the things that we see of the challenges in our communities, our healthcare disparities, our poverty rates, whatever it may be, whatever you're passionate about, through our books, we're also helping to develop a sense of agency within our diverse and multicultural communities to know that progress is ours 
and we can create our own progress. They also have a sense that I will be. I will be gives us a sense as well about power and legacy. Who are we? What do we create? So one of my dreams is to work on a new book project that highlights many of these prominent but often unsung heroes. Once you're outside of the continent, unsung heroes of Pan-Africanism. So diversity in books, we don't know the stories of folks like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah or Marcus Garvey as we go throughout the diaspora and go throughout the world. But we know that if we did learn about them, we would learn about some of the pioneers, some of those who dare to believe that all people are equal, some of those who dare to believe that we all have a shared destiny, that we all, as the words of Senator Wellstone, we all do better when we all do better. But we have to create it. Those just can't be words. How do we make it happen? So our commitment to our young people is to, and that's why we created book series around this, to invite them to embark on a journey, to learn more about the leaders who come ahead of them, who've left a legacy, who've shown them how to use their power, how to use their voice, how to use their intellect to make a difference. So here's Marcus Garvey. He says, no one knows when the hour of Africa's redemption cometh. It is in the wind. One day, like a storm, it will be here. When that day comes, all Africa will stand together. And this photo is once again from our pilgrimage in 2019 for the year of return. That's our brothers and sisters. And we're here in front of the Marcus Garvey House, which is also the home of an extension of the United Nations, their embassy for people of the African diaspora. So what does this all look like? And what is our challenge? I know I'm also talking to the parents, the educators, the community members. But we also have a challenge for ourselves. I focus primarily on the lessons that I teach the young people. But here's our challenge on how do we take intentional action for justice and equity. Now, we can combine multiple different leadership styles to make this happen. I just highlighted three. I think we can make a difference by serving as those servant leaders that we're willing to serve and roll up our sleeves in our community, and that we will build block by block, brick by brick, household by household, a more just and equitable society, that we'll work on issues, whether it's related to affordable housing, access to quality health care. That's us. How will we serve? How will we make an impact? We'll also commit ourselves to transformational leadership. The reality of this is making sure that we are coming together around our collective values and motivating others to reach higher heights. What are our community values? What does it look like? What words come to mind? So here's a little inspiration. This could even be a family activity. What are the values of your family? How do you live them out? What does it look like? And then last but not least, authentic leadership. That we're leading from the heart, the soul, and the spirit to be impactful in some meaningful ways. So this is just some tips as adults that we can incorporate into our lives to make a difference in the lives of the children, whether it's our own children, the children that we work with in our local schools or in our communities. Part of the challenge that we have to think about as we say those words, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have to model the way and take strategic action to make sure those words are not just something we write on a page, but they are part of our lived values. So how do we do that? People say, well, that sounds quite like a challenge, quite difficult. Where do we get started? Here's one woman's testimony on how I've gotten started. So you're just seeing one person. And can you imagine if we all decided to make a difference? What would it look like? What would it take? What would our communities, what would our world look like? And I'll also pause here because I think oftentimes we're tempted to just think it's about you and I. But based upon my faith and cultural tradition, we are indebted to seven generations beyond us. So that means when I'm taking action, when I'm thinking, when I'm strategizing on how to make the world a better place and how I left it, I'm thinking about how do you do that for generations? Hence why books matter. So for those of you who are thinking about writing a book, are considering it, I'm encouraging you to take action because your books are a part of, oh, the lion telling their story telling a part of the chapters of history to anchor us, to be able to know, especially for diverse books, that we're here. 
when I say we, we as people of color, we're here. We're helping to shape the future of America and the world. So our stories have to be a part of that experience. So what does it look like for me? It's not just writing books. It's also about policy advocacy. For instance, I listed here the campaign for prison phone justice. It's been my work for over a decade now to make sure that I was taking a stand to ensure that prison phone calls were fair, reasonable, and just. At over a dollar per minute, many family members could not remain in contact and still can't today with their incarcerated loved ones. So our stand was to make sure that there was a cap placed on the high cost of those prison phone calls to make them accessible, to make it so, and then you want to relate this back to children, oftentimes we forget this, but the initial data that we worked on related to the number of children in Minnesota alone, there are over 15,000 children who have an incarcerated parent. When we look at it more broadly, you have over a million children nationally who have an incarcerated parent. In fact, even Sesame Street responded to it with a new character named Alex to deal with the trauma and grief that's associated with having an incarcerated parent. So when you think about this specifically, it's more than just our work related to books. It's more than just our work related to a conversation. But I encourage us all to get involved civically and to take a stand for justice in some meaningful ways. And notice what I said. By getting involved, you get to set your own agenda. I'm not talking about partisanship here. I'm talking about being involved and aligning it with those family values that I talked about earlier. And what type of world would you like to lead? Not for today, not just for the next generation, but seven generations out. What's your responsibility? I also work on a number of initiatives around leadership strategies for advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's why I'm here today. Because it will take more than a conversation. It will take more than a bias training. We're talking about clear goals and objectives. We're talking about benchmarks, assessments. We're talking about the same way we have a business imperative that we also put diversity, equity, and inclusion at the center of our agenda. How do we know we're successful? And let's just talk squarely about children's books. What's the diversity in the books that we're publishing? Who's at the table as the publishers, as the editors? Who's at the table? Even if we look at book awards, who's there? Do we have diversity in judges? Asking those questions throughout the entirety of the process, from a book from inception all the way to the final completion of the book. Where is the diversity? I know we look at the data oftentimes about who are authors of color. We also look at it of who's the main character or protagonist. But now is the time. Are, is there diversity in illustrators? Is there diversity in every role throughout a publishing company? What does it look like? Is there diversity in the journals that feature uh, children's books? We have plenty of questions to ask because we know, and here it is, my friends, we just got updated census data yesterday. The question then becomes that we all have to think about is as our nation, as the United States is evolving into this tapestry of diversity of experiences of backgrounds but specifically related to race and ethnicity are we taking this on as an opportunity to activate our faith for the future of our nation are we activating our fear i hope we choose the former because the former will give us keys to our future destiny of a stronger more innovative society the latter fear will allow us to continue to just rattle off data about challenges and inequities without any solutions. And we're losing talent, starting with our young people. So here it is, a range of books that I worked on. But since I'm talking about the census, let's look at the top one. Stand Up and Be Counted. That book is available for a free download on our bookstore or on our website. And it encouraged folks to get involved, to understand the census. But more importantly, to make sure that they understand that their voice matters and that they should be counted. So why does this matter to me? How does this connect to my books? How does this connect to the work? Stand Up and Be Counted is the first of its kind opportunity to use a book to inspire young people. And why did I choose to put time and energy in this project? Because I know 10 years out, remember how I said we're indebted to the future? I know in 2030, the same young people who will be reading my book, Stand Up and Be Counted, will have an opportunity 
to make sure that their households are counted. They'll get those letters in the mail, and now they will be familiar with what that really means. And what does being counted mean? It means that our communities can make sure they get their fair share of resources. We're talking about building better communities, stronger, healthier communities, more vibrant families. A part of it is the census to make sure that everyone is counted for and each community gets its appropriate allocation of resources. So it's critically important. And then last but not least, you can find me as a scholar and a researcher using all these tools that you've seen me use today, the oral advocacy, the critical thinking, and bringing all this analytical data together, of course, and helping to impact wide-scale policy and systems change around the school-to-prison pipeline, looking at mass incarceration more broadly, and also on how we train and teach about leadership. So when we look at this, and let's step in a little bit closer. When we look at this through our racial justice lens, we really see a call to action. And I'm going to rely on George Washington Carver for this. He reminds us where there is no vision, there is no hope. And I know we oftentimes know Dr. George Washington Carver as the peanut man with hundreds of patents around peanuts and sweet potatoes. So there are some fun books that you can share with the special young people in your life about George Washington Carver. But I also want to remind you that he had a clear vision for our children and for the future. He had a vision that really focused on a racial justice lens. And I define racial justice for us here as the creation and proactive enforcement of policies, practices, attitudes, and actions that produce equitable power, opportunities, treatment, and outcomes for all. What did that mean for George Washington Carver? It meant that he was creating, through his own action, through his own practices, improving agriculture in the South to make sure that Black farmers could eat, could produce income. He was also, through his policies, practices, and attitudes, he was helping to ensure equal access to higher education. We know him and we know his work as it relates to Tuskegee University. So why does this all matter? Because oftentimes we all say we want diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's become buzzwords now. But a vision requires action. And how do we bring forth that action in meaningful ways? Through a clear purpose, through metrics, through benchmarks, and ongoing evaluation. We can say we want diverse books, but we shouldn't still be sitting there looking at the same data year after year after year. We know what we need to change. We know that the demographics have already changed as it relates to children. As of 2019, based upon the data from the Children's Defense Fund, if we look at the new births of children, the vast majority of children born by 2019 were children from racially diverse ethnic backgrounds. So once again, will we meet that with faith or will we meet it with fear? If we meet it with faith, we know that we need to, type, to continue to create the type of learning experiences that cultivate and bring all students together in some meaningful ways. So how do we do this? One of the ways and one of the tools that I'll share with you, it's available to you free of charge, is our Leaders Journey 365 tool that has a number of different leadership resources available for you and also for all the special children in your life as well. In addition, through the power of partnership, if we're going to say that we want diverse books, if we want to inspire young people to become those leaders who are readers, we started to get involved. So here's another piece for you. I mean you. If you're thinking about making a difference, if you're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, what does it really look like? We decided to take action. So through the sale of our book, Justice Makes a Difference, 100% of the proceeds go directly to what? Donating the books, getting books in the hands of children, teaching children about leadership, about being impactful in their community, and inspiring the young people. It's one of the most heart-touching stories that we received was a photo from a father who showed his daughter and his son, and she said the most compelling words. If we think diversity, equity, and inclusion doesn't matter, Inclusivity is something that's optional, but she shouted out, Daddy, it's me, as she held onto the book. 
Can you imagine that? When I was a child, I never got to say that. I mean, eventually, maybe by middle school, Sweet Valley High had added an African-American girl. So did the Babysitter's Club. But think about this. Spending my whole childhood not seeing a book that reflected me. And so here it is. I would say the same thing if I was going back in time. Here it is. Daddy, it's me. Mommy, it's me. Here we are. I see myself in justice makes a difference. So how can you get involved? How can you support? First and foremost, share the information that you learned today about the importance of diversity in books. Share the information about the changing landscape of America and how we will meet that with faith, faith for the future of the endless and infinite possibilities of all of our children. Get involved. You can follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also purchase our books like Justice Makes a Difference. You can go to our bookstore website. In addition, if you have a book club and you want to get more involved, we have our curated list for our bookshop as well. Come on in. Join the fun. Join the book club. Join the discussion. Join our webinars. Because I am convinced and my work has shown me, my experience has shown me, my faith has shown me that we are stronger together than we are apart. So I'll conclude the way I began. Now is the time to plant people, grow justice. What does that look like? Planting people is about everyday people, the young, the old. We're all coming together at intergenerational peace across our differences of where we come from, all those pieces. But really, it's about planting those seeds, those seeds of understanding that we have a leader within. Leadership is not just for someone with a position or a title. It's for each and every one of us to roll up our sleeves, get involved, and start building the future. Growing justice is the manifestation as we come forward, as we bring forth change, whether it's through writing a children's book, illustrating a children's book, whatever it may be that's within your sphere of influence. How can you use it to make sure that we're supporting not just this generation, but those seven generations of making sure that we are helping to build the reality of our shared humanity and common destiny? Thank you.